I offer my greetings and well wishes. Good morning to our friends in North and South America. Good afternoon to our friends in the UK and Europe. Good early evening to our friends in the Middle East. Good evening to our friends in India, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia. Good late evening to our friends in Australia. I hope you are well. Nice to see your faces. Looking at this screen, I can see a good number of people who were recently in India with me. It's nice to see you again. Tonight we are having a bit of a sharing about the, the pilgrimage that I led with uh, recently in India with many of the people that joined these Zoom sessions and also a personal period of retreat that I had. And, uh, it's a big subject. I'll try to, uh, it's probably going to be uh, meandering uh, with many tangents, multifaceted jewel, hopefully, <laughs> of some interest to you. I guess uh, one thing I'm mindful of is not everybody attended a pilgrimage. So why is it relevant? It's a good question. Why is the subject of pilgrimage relevant to me wherever I am in the world? Maybe I've never been on a pilgrimage. Maybe I've never never will go on a pilgrimage this lifetime. So just by way of preface, it's a, uh, in the five spiritual powers, we have faith first. And uh, faith is uh, confidence in Lord Buddha's teachings, confidence in the fact of enlightenment, that he realized it, confidence in his uh, teachings, the Dhamma, the path, confidence in our own abilities. Pilgrimage is one of the ways that we demonstrate our faith. And by demonstrating faith, it deepens our faith. And uh, many modern people, less so possibly with Southeast Asians, but uh, some Southeast Asians also, people can be, modern people can be a bit heady, a bit intellectual. And uh, it's fine. It's fine to be intelligent. It's fine to have discriminating wisdom. But faith to be truly powerful has the confidence in the teachings component, confidence in Nibbana, in enlightenment component. But there is also the, a heart quality, which is more of a, was more about trust, deep, deep, deep trust, and deep, deep, deep gratitude, and deep, deep love, very wholesome love. So when we go to places where there are a lot of traditional Buddhists doing their chanting together, you can feel this beautiful energy of faith. So it's not just an intellectual uh, accepting, yes, I believe what Buddha taught, it makes sense. No, when we think of what Lord Buddha taught and that it makes sense, we feel a tremendous sense of gratitude that Lord Buddha taught it. We feel, it, feel a tremendous sense of love and trust for the fact that the Buddha became enlightened. It's a, it's a sense of a, awe and amazement even that enlightenment is even possible. Uh, you know, how wonderful. So when we, when we go on pilgrimage, we're deepening those qualities, we're making our faith indriya into a faith bala, a power, the power of faith. And then when we have that, the next of the five spiritual powers is energy. And so people who have strong faith have a lot of energy. Arjun Samedo once said that uh, the happiest people he ever saw in his life were the Tibetans doing three steps, one bow practice around Mount Kailash. Now, I think the lowest point of elevation around Mount Kailash is 5,000 meters. There isn't much oxygen. It's really, really difficult to get around it. It's like 50 kilometers of walking it takes three or four days for most people. And these Tibetans were like throwing themselves on the rocky ground and having to add on to this exertion, the fact of bowing down and getting up. And he said they were the happiest people he'd seen in there in his life with his eyes shining like diamonds. Well, that's the power of faith and the power of energy that comes from that quality of faith, really quite extraordinary. And sometimes we, when we witness other people who are practicing very sincerely, very wholesomely, it's uh, we can have mudita for that, very beautiful quality of mudita. And also we, we, get, we get a, it's like if we can resonate with the expressions of faith of others and the uh, expressions of energy of others, I believe that also increases our capacity to put forth more energy. And sometimes we need to learn 
you know, it might be appropriate for the Tibetan practitioners to bow all day in Bogaya. That might not work for me where I am. But then we can we can do some thinking. How can where are the areas in my life? Where are the the places in my practice where I can increase my energy? I, I you know had that insight myself when I was I was doing some of these full length prostrations in Bogaya for a period of time. Two, three, four, five hundred a day for one of the times I went a long time ago. And um, then I would come and sit and I noticed that sitting was harder after the bowing because there was a lot of muscle aches and pains. And, uh, and I kind of had the insight that, uh, well, I'm part of the Thai forest tradition, the meditation tradition. So maybe I should try to meditate all day. If the Tibetans are bowing all day, maybe I should try to meditate all day. And I made a commitment to trying to increase the amount of hours I sat as, as my way of deepening my effort, expressing my face. There's this thing called a Pati Pati Puja, Lord Buddha described that the best way to make offerings to the Buddha is through our practice. So that we can offer flowers, we can offer fragrances, we can make offerings to monks and nuns and monasteries, it's all wholesome. But Lord Buddha said, the best offering of practice that honors Buddha is to practice. So that's another reason we, we go on pilgrimages to see all these other people practicing and, and to intensify our own practice. Another thing that, uh, another list which is relevant, of course, going back to the five spiritual powers, when you get stronger faith and more energy, you then have to apply that energy into the next three powers, right? You have to try to be consistently mindful throughout your postures. You bring your energy and you, you uh, invest it into being mindful, more mindful. You have the energy to do that. You have the resolve to do that. And also you see the benefit when you're more consistently mindful, you're going to get more samadhi. When you get more samadhi, more peace, more calm, more coolness, less reactivity, more stability, you see the benefit of that. And with a stable mind, it becomes possible to see the characteristics of phenomenon. Then we start getting wisdom. So all of these things support one another as a progression. A strong faith, lots of energy, consistent mindfulness, more stable mind, insight into the nature of reality, the nature of characteristics. But another list which is relevant is the factors of jhanas. <clears throat> Many people are interested in developing more concentration because uh, the wholesome peace that comes from a cool, gathered, collected mind. So in that list, we have the vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. It's the placing the mind on the meditation object, knowing that meditation object. If it's a wholesome meditation object and we're really with the object in a skillful way, feelings of rapture arise. And so one of the things that many people experience, one of the reasons for going on pilgrimage, is that when you go to the place where, for example, Lord Buddha was enlightened, and you think of that fact of the Buddha's enlightenment, many people, probably most people who have some faith in the Buddha, will feel quite strong rapture. And that manifests differently for different people. For some people, it just might be deep, deep, deep gratitude. For other people, it can be like tears of, of uh, loving appreciation. And, uh, but it's good, to, it's good to experience this, these different types of wholesome mental happiness. Because in our somewhat sensual and hedonistic modern world, we're used to getting our pleasure from nice taste, nice sounds, nice touch. And... The thing is, mental happiness is superior, but we don't know that unless we experience it. So you can get some pleasant feelings running through your mind through sensual contact, sensual experience, but it's it's always a bit kind of dirty or a bit hot and it's fleeting. The mind grasps at it. There's always a bad aftertaste. With mental happiness coming from a wholesome object, there's no bad aftertaste. It's it's a really really pleasant, really wholesome. And uh, so it's good to experience it. And um, it also is kind of consciousness expanding. So, so oftentimes we, we have our contracted world. We have our kind of habits in our life. We tend to get into ruts. So another one of the values of going on pilgrimage is like you go somewhere, it's like you don't know this place. You, there's a lot of strange things going on. And you, it's like, yeah, you're not in your old habits anymore. And you see that you know the way you practice, but you're seeing all these different ways that other people practice. It's a, 
is consciousness expanding and I, all of these things are good i think you know because you know habits are deep and they obstruct us and so when we find ways to kind of rattle things a little bit make it a bit more porous so it's like the thin end thin edge of the wedge you know it's like you, you there's what do they say there's eighty four thousand dhamma doors different ways to have insights or glimpse light glimpse dhamma so it's like when you take yourself out of your normal habits normal circles that we run around in and you and you go and you expose yourself to different things one of the things we did of course was i i always take my students to go and look at the burning ghats on varanasi which isn't a buddhist holy site but it's a very profound and special thing to do and when you see bodies burning all around you and you have ash and smoke blowing in your face and the ashes of burning bodies that died that day right in your face it it is a confronting experience and uh, I, some of my Thai students went along, two of my Thai students, and one of them said, what am I still working for? I'm old already, and not very long I'm going to be one of these bur burning bodies. It's, it just has that kind of effect on consciousness. It's like, we all come to this. What am I doing? It's holding a mirror to the way we're living our lives. And uh, you know, another one of the values of going on pilgrimage, particularly in India, is that uh, when you see the harshness and the poverty of many of the people who live in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, there's just a natural feeling of recognition of what the good fortune we have and uh, of not taking that for granted. And so many, many people go back to their normal life with a more appreciation for it. And uh, which is, you know, appreciation, it's very close to mudita, Brahma Vihara, appreciation, gratitude. And, uh, you know, all human beings probably have a gift for imagining how things could be better and uh, we all have gifts at holding grudges and being malcontented. So when we when we develop a bit more of a sense of perspective and we come back and we have qualities like appreciation, more contentment, then the, the mind is more wholesome. Recognition of the blessings that have already manifested in our lives and then, a, a deter then an, an understanding of what caused that. That's the law of karma. So, you know, merit really is real so we we don't want to just use up our merit we want to keep producing the kind of merits that we made that manifested our current situation because we also see the contrast what's it like for people with who are struggling with some heavy karmas or haven't produced enough much merit how harsh is their life when you see thousands of people for whom everyday life is a real struggle it's uh, it's good for one's perspective so with rapture, of course, the next of the jhana factors, uh, placing the mind on the meditation object, really being with the object, experiencing strong rapture, then the deeper is the tranquility. So another thing I try to do on pilgrimage is get people to sit longer than they normally would. Then uh, with the extra energy they have and the extra faith and the group support, many people do have some of the most peaceful sits that they've had in their life. And uh, then we see how it works, how lifting one's face, how having more energy helps in the practice of having more resolution. And then when you have more resolution, more energy, more faith, sit longer, get through that, get through that point where you normally you would get up and go somewhere else and get up and do something else. No, you just sit, sit longer. And then uh, people experience more collectedness, more, they call it concentration. I, I prefer collectedness. Oftentimes there's a sense of, I don't, I don't really like the word concentration because it's kind of, it's a bit like concentrating on the textbook to, so that you pass the test or whatever. It's really not like that. It's, uh, it's the mind being still, but often there's a vast sense of space and expansiveness. So it's having a stillness in, in vast empty space, which isn't moving. And uh, so I, collectedness seems to, settledness, collectedness seems to capture that a bit better. So this is one of the reasons we go on pilgrimage. And uh, so if you're one of the people that hasn't had the opportunity, you can join us in a virtual pilgrimage as we share some photographs. And then just think of, think of ways, how can you embellish, deepen, nourish your faith? How can you... Uh, put forth more energy and uh, 
sometimes it's just a matter of like really like we have faith in the buddha but we take it for granted a bit or it's a bit perfunctory we we'll sit down and really think about it sometimes why do i have faith in the buddha and just like we don't just perfunctorily doing the chant the buddha is awake and holy perfect it's like think of those phrases he is impeccable in conduct and understanding do you know anyone else in your life who is impeccable in conduct and understanding he is teacher of gods and humans. So gods means devas, the deities. Wow. He is awake and holy. So what's that mean? Yeah, so we, we kind of just really think about it a bit. That's another thing we do when we go on pilgrimage, when we put down the other activities of our life, we're able to focus on the spiritual refuge. Okay, why do I have faith in the Buddha? What's so special about him anyway? And the more you think about that, oh, he really is special, actually. <laughs> and uh, so let's share some photos now. JC, I think you put them in some kind of an order, right? Here we go. Selfie on the plane. <laughs> plane is taking off. It's a very interesting feeling when you're sitting on a plane and about one third of the passengers are your students joining you on a pilgrimage. It's, um, it's a bit of a weird feeling, actually. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I want to say is a bit of a miracle. Maybe you can move on to one of the Bodh Gaya pictures. There we are. First seat at the Bodh Gaya. We didn't get many pictures in Bodh Gaya because it was extremely crowded. Like this is a footpath and you can see on the right and the left, every anywhere where there's a spot for somebody to sit, people are sitting there. We arrived and that's the Bodhi tree, back to that photo, that's the Bodhi tree above my head, very big Bodhi tree. And um, yeah, next picture. So one of the things I want to mention about this pilgrimage is about 69 people attended, I believe, uh, of pilgrims. And then there were the Thai guides. And, uh, you know, there wasn't one single, what I would call difficult person or even complicated person. There was no, and there was no serious injury or illness. And uh, of all the various pilgrimages I've attended or been a part of, this was actually the smoothest. And I think it has something to do with six months before the pilgrimage. I, I was encouraging those who would attend to spread metta to the tour guide, to the monks, and to all of the other pilgrims to dedicate merit to their karmic debtors where they live and where they're going, to those in India as well, and to uh, invite your ancestors to come along if they're in a position to, like inviting the devas to join you dedicating merits to the whole group, spreading metta to the whole group. And we had a very, very smooth, enjoyable pilgrimage and uh, with no dramas. I remember the, the previous one, the, and I, I'm not making any comment. Nobody did anything wrong. It's just, I'm just the, I guess the point I'm making is I'm, I believe that metta is very powerful, setting the intentions and months beforehand and dedicating it in a focused way has some quite profound effects that I would deduce. Previous pilgrimage I was on, the uh, one lady fainted in the very first Dharma talk in the deer park. She was diabetic. She forgot to take her medicine. The next day, a lady had diarrhea. She, she, we had to have her lying down in a separate hire car, traveling in the car with a doctor. Uh, two days later, another person broke their ankle in the coming down the staircase. And uh, yes, and then. Uh, Grand finale, Joyce got bitten by a monkey while we were sitting in meditation. <laughs> that one was just uh, interesting. And I was kind of thinking, I was thinking, oh, is it going to be like that again? Kind of bracing myself. Let's see what happens this time. And uh, there was no single significant drama. Quite amazing, actually. So I'm very grateful for that. So the protective power of metta, I would, I would deduce. The, I guess the negative karma or the challenging karma that this group has, I feel, was this group obviously had some kind of karma with noise and crowds. Like we we definitely met some big crowds and a lot of noise. 
And uh, I remember coming back with just Tissero for my retreat. We wandered into Bodh Gaya. There was hardly any queue. We went to sit under the Bodhi tree. Our spaces were just free. And we sat. We had quite a nice sat for three hours and sat for the <laughs> no dramas, lots of space. But when, when I went with the group, there was, yeah, we went for the second time. We were going to try to find a space for 60 people to sit. There wasn't a space for 60 people to sit. I had to say to everyone, okay, just find a spot anywhere and I'll meet you in three hours under the Bodhi tree. And uh, that's what we did. But it worked in its own way. And it was nice for people to see what Bodh Gaya is like when it's really pumping, when there's a really, really big group doing the puja. It was the Nyingma Monlam Chenmo and many of the Tibetan Buddhist practitioners from places like Sikkim and Kashmir and Nepal and the, t the Tibetans in exile. So definitely very uh, atmospheric. So... Next picture. Yes, this is Prabuddha Metta in the Vihara inside the Chedi. So this is an ancient Buddha statue. He's actually made of black stone, but he's been gold leafed. And uh, he's uh, very respected, revered. Here's very early in the morning. We're going up to the place where Lord Buddha practiced the six years of austerities, eating just one handful, one palmful of uh, rice or lentils, etc., made the group get up quite early in my understanding that if we get there before anyone else, we'll probably get some quiet time to meditate. And uh, we were fairly successful. I think we got about an hour and a half of fairly quiet sitting up on top of the Dunga Shweri, it's called, the Austerities Cave. There's a tiny little cave inside where it's believed the Bodhisattva practiced austerities for six years and where he said it is possible that uh, another spiritual practitioner had suffered as much in their striving, but not possible that anybody suffered more. That's how sincere and earnest he had been in that period. And it has a has a different feeling. It has a uh, it has a kind of a in a feeling of intensity. So that's our group, and uh, the cave was just behind where we are there. The um, Lumpur Biak said, this is a very good spot to make determinations. So if there's areas in one's practice that one needs to kind of be a bit more determined in, this is a good place to go and make a pledge. But of course, if you make a pledge in such a place, you do have to really try to keep it. So, But uh, once you get the conviction and you think you can keep it, but a, an activity like this might help you, it's a good thing to do. Go and make some determinations, aspirations the austerity cave. So yeah, when we went back and just told everybody, find a spot to sit somewhere, had this very interesting experience and uh, where a somewhat crazy Russian nun, when I sat in my seat, started to yell at me. And um, Panya Siri, who is a bhikkhu who's living with me now from Kazakhstan, he he understands Russian, and he told me afterwards, yeah, she was swearing the worst curse words and the most most vulgar insults possible in the Russian language. <laughs> and um, I didn't understand, of course, but I, did, I turned around and I looked at her and I says, it is not skillful for you to be speaking to a good bhikkhu like this in this place. I thought, let's see if that works at which point she yelled at me louder and faster and the bits of spit were flying out of her mouth. And, 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 I, <laughs> and I have a theory about this. I, I have a theory that if you're going to be brave or bold enough to help 70 other human beings, you're no longer working with just your karma. This was, I think this was a mixed karma. This was, this was the result of help, helping a lot of people because when I came back by myself, there was no crazy Russian nun yelling at me. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a really interesting, it was a very interesting practicing in faith and trust. Like, okay, I put in my earplugs, I pulled the hat over my eyes and I just sat and I trusted, okay, I've got enough friends in close vicinity. If she actually starts hitting me, I'm sure some of my friends will help me, you know, and I just meditated, but she continued to yell at me while I was with earplugs in my ears and hat pulled on my face and facing them. She yelled at me for another five minutes. But just like the Buddha said, I will not move from my this spot. Let my blood dry up. I sat for three hours. <laughs> and she didn't hit me. So 
May she be well, may she be happy. My favorite meditation spot in this world, facing the Mahabodhi Chedi. That gold leaf Buddha, I believe I I put that there myself about 15 years ago, I think. It's still there. Sujata, the place where Sujata offered the milk rice is another place where we went. Very important thing occurred there is like a contemplation I often remind people about is no matter how ready Lord Buddha was to do his profound spiritual striving, when you're a human being, you must depend upon the kindness of others. And uh, the role of nourishment, the, the role of sweetness and tenderness in just the right amount that nourishes intense practice, that's what this place means to me. And so we, we went early in the morning once again to have some quiet hours before the other groups arrived. And uh, it was really quiet. Very cold, if I recall. It's probably about eight degrees in the morning, eight, nine, ten, foggy. And uh, but we all had a nice sit there. This is a, this is commemorates where Sujata's house was, Lady Sujata. There we were sitting in the nice when the sun came up and the fog lifted pleasantly, warm, pleasant, well, not as cold. I'm not sure if it was warm. So next we went to Veluvana, the bamboo grove. And, uh, I've been studying about bamboo because I started painting bamboo. This is Himalayan blue bamboo, in case you were wondering. They uh, they planted many different types of bamboo in the traditional, in the historical site of the bamboo grove. And I've been going there for, I guess, 20 years. And um, it used to be a really dingy, uninspiring place where you used, used to have to imagine use your imagination to imagine it as a bamboo grove and imagine the Buddha there with the 1,250 arahants. But now it's actually quite a nice park-like space and there's, there really is a lot of beautiful bamboo around. So once we left after breakfast and had our sit in the Veluvana, the first monastery offered by King Bimbisara to Lord Buddha after he walked into Rajkir with the Kasapa brothers who'd recently become enlightened listening to the fire sermon. So there were over a thousand arahants in tow. The king offered him the bamboo grove. This is where he taught the Awada Patimoka, the very beginning of the laying down of the rules of discipline. We were fortunate as we were sitting, a, a wonderful monk from Northern Thailand, Lumpo Tongdang, passed through. After our sit, we were able to go and pay respects to him as well. So this is in Rajkia. It's a site where ancient ox carts and horse carts have ground deep ruts into the stone. So it's just one of those places you go and stand and you just acknowledge, yes, it's true. Human civilization has been here for thousands of years. And, uh, this may have been the very road that Lord Buddha walked along as he walked into Rajkia. So that's a nice, uh, a nice recollection. Vulture's Peak Mountain. We went twice. Vulture's Peak was the place where Lord Buddha himself would go for periods of retreat. And uh, I'm sure teaching the devas in the, in the evening. It's also, there's a cave where Sariputta became enlightened while fanning Lord Buddha as he was teaching uh, Diganaka, Samana. So yeah, we, we, it's good. It's interesting. I, I, I like to return to the same site several times. And that was a good idea because the first afternoon when we were meditating on top of Vulture's Peak, it was pretty crazy actually. But we had had a very lovely sit in the Sariputta and Mahamogalana caves before that. And then the next morning when we came up, but, you know, just like here we are imagining Sariputta fanning the Buddha and becoming enlightened and becoming the chief disciple with the recollecting that, just the fact that, how wonderful, this great, another great being who built this virtue for so long, 
and became equal to Lord Buddha in wisdom, became an arahant in that very spot. And then he was considered to be the wet nurse of the Sangha. He nurtured uh, many, many, many people to the point of stream entry. And uh, so as a wet nurse in ripening people's faculties and uh, supporting them in the practice until they entered the stream of Dhamma. <clears throat> Mahamogalana was uh, revered for helping them finish off their work, become arahants. So yes, very nice sunset. And uh, <clears throat> We went twice, so this might have been the next morning. I can't remember which photo was from which one, but this is the place where Lord Buddha's kuti was believed to be. The air quality, you can see behind, it wasn't actually cloudy. This is this very interesting combination of dust and fog that happens in northern India in winter. I think there was a PM 2.5 of about 300 on top of Vulture's Peak. And the, the people in Bangkok get kind of worried and excited and don't want to go outside if it gets up to 150. So where we were, it was 300. And I just encourage people to breathe in the sacred dust, holy dust. Don't make a problem out of it. <laughs> You're on pilgrimage. Everything is sacred. <laughs> and sometimes the grayish, browny, hazy air is, uh, gives a certain mystical quality to the photographs. <laughs> so, we chanted the Heart Sutra, actually. In, uh, Ezra chanted it in Sanskrit. We chanted it in Mandarin and Tansampanu chanted it in Korean. And then we also chanted the Anatalakana Sutta in the morning session. We went very early in the morning as uh, before sunrise and we did get it to ourselves for a while. So it was chalk and cheese. The uh, evening was really crazy and the, the next morning was very serene. That's the value of returning to the same spot several times. You increase your chances of having a good experience. It does feel very close to heaven there on top of the hill. You can imagine the Buddha teaching large numbers of devas. Yeah, it was very windy that afternoon, that first afternoon. The auspicious prayer flags fluttering in the breeze. So this is at Nalanda University, the ruins of the ancient Nalanda University. So Nalanda is, for us Theravadans, Nalanda is famous as being the birthplace of, of Sariputta. And it's also the place where he returned to pass into final Nibbana, teaching his mother as the last person that he taught. And that, that structure behind us is the Sariputta stupa. And some people believe there are relics to Sariputta still contained inside. Of course, it was a monastic university for about a thousand years with about 15,000 monastics and uh, Theravada and Mahayana Vajrayana all living and practicing together. And we visited the museum there. Saw some really stunning artifacts which show just how uh, skilled and developed the art was. It's my personal favorite image of Babalokiteshvara. When I see this image, I think it was the prototype for the thousand-armed image that later went to Tibet and China. And, but what I like about it is it's so realistic. He has all these arms, but it looks natural somehow. He doesn't look like a, a kind of a insect. He looks like a <laughs> human being with... Uh, many celestial uh, arms. Very, very beautiful statue. When I see that statue, I kind of fall to my knees and I, I always sneakily rub a bit of sandalwood oil in front of him. And uh, We asked permission to do a little chant in the uh, Indian. That's a nice thing about in Indian. Well, Indian people, religion is allowed in daily life. You know, you, you don't have to separate your religion from your daily life. And we ask, can we do some chanting? And the guard is like, yeah, sure. Do some chanting. So. Padma Pani. Yeah, so we meditated for a long session in front of the Sariputta cave. And that, that 
portion, that thing structure right in front of us is a stupa, I believe, and it has the stucco work. So they were famous for their bronze, their carving in stone, but also making images out of stucco. And they're still intact, these ones, images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So after Malanda, we went to Varanasi and took a boat. And we took these pictures of the burning ghats, Shiva's burning ghats, Managati ghat in Varanasi. We took these pictures from the boat, try to be a bit respectful, not to be taking pictures on the site itself with the grieving relatives. But these are, you can see in the foreground, bodies covered with yellow and orange cloth. So those are corpses. Normally they would have been people that died that day. There's some uh, ceremonies normally at home. The chanting occurs at home. There's no chanting performed on the burning ghat. The burning ghat is considered sacred by the Hindu Hindus and uh, the, the water is holy. They don't need to do any chanting. And the uh, Hindus who believe in Shiva believe that if they're burnt here and uh, last little bit of bone that remains is tossed into the river, they believe that they get to live in the company of Shiva in heaven afterwards. Of course, as Buddhists, we uh, we believe in karma. If you have the sufficient merit, you will rise. If you have demerit, Lord Buddha says you will sink like a rock. But uh, when we go there and we contemplate this, I did take the whole group. Uh, we walked, walked among this and... Um, it's always a profound. And our group, when we left, we did chant the Metta Sutta, dedicate merit in case we have any relatives there that had been waiting for us. And we did that again, once again on the bus. And uh, I always kind of secretly say, okay, if there's any ghosts hanging around, we already dedicated merit to you. We did what we could. Don't follow us into the hotel. We'll come back next time. <laughs> Do some more. But, uh, we offered a little candle and flowers to the Ganges River. This is a, one of the things they do in Thailand as well at the Loi Kratong Festival. We also, we also have the tradition of showing gratitude to rivers and for water, for farming and for drinking and bathing and all these things. Yeah. Our boat. Our offering to the river. This is the watching the Brahmin priests do what's called the evening arti. I think it's prayers to the goddess of the Ganges and to Shiva, possibly to Rama. I don't understand the Sanskrit, so I'm not completely sure what they say. But this has been occurring here for a very long time. It's just nice to see some of the culture and uh, all of these local people who have faith and reverence and respect. Nice to soak up a bit of ancient atmosphere. Varanasi is considered a timeless city, there's a flame on the burning ghats, which is believed to have not blown out for 5,000 years, Shiva's flame, from which they light the funeral pyres. So it's a special place. And of course, if you study the Jataka stories, the, the uh, lives of the Bodhisattva, many of them start with in one life in Banaras, the Bodhisattva had uh, such and such a experience, cultivated such and such a virtue, so Banaras is kind of like the stomping ground, a place where bodhisattvas make parami. So in that regards, it is a, a Buddhist holy site as well. And not very far from Varanasi, of course, is Sarnath, the site of Isipatana, Mikadaye, the deer park, where Lord Buddha taught the Dhammachaka Sutta and the Anathalakana Sutta. So the next morning, early in the morning, we went there. In the morning, we chanted the Dhammachaka Sutta. Then we had our lunch and we went to the museum. In the afternoon, we came back and we chanted the Anattalakana Sutta. My mind was just becoming peaceful in half an hour. You see that beautiful mystical haze in the air? The PM 2.5 in Sarnath on that day was 430. <laughs> My mind was just becoming peaceful at half an hour, and then it was like, <coughs> 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 
coughed up a bunch of mucus that my body was producing, trying to protect my lungs from the from the dust. But it's holy dust. It's sacred dust. It, it has to be done. You, you, can, yeah. you can feel the breath more easily in Sarnath in the winter. It's like it has a more viscosity. <laughs> Breathing in, aware of the in-breath. Breathing out, aware of the out-breath. <laughs> Feelings. But many people had peaceful sits. It's very amazing to think of the Anya Kondanya realizing stream entry and the Dhamma wheel being set in motion that no Brahman, no Deva, no Mara, no king, no one can stop. In this site, the culmination of Lord Buddha developing those virtues and uh, that wisdom for so long, the Dhamma was going to be in the world, spreading in the world for a long, long, long time. And so this is the site where Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha became manifest in the world. And in subsequent days, teaching the Anattalakana Sutta, all five of the first ascetics became bhikkhus and uh, became arahants in this place. Then there was Yasa, the merchant's son, and then Yasa's friends. Many people became arahants. Lumpur Anand told me that many, many, many devas listening to the Dhamma Chakra Sutta also became enlightened. So a lot of a lot of beings who cultivate virtue and they want to get enlightened listening to a teaching of a Buddha, some people actually delay their liberation from the point where they could have been liberation because they want to be li liberated. They love Buddha so much, they love the Dharma so much, they want to be liberated by listening to the Dharma from a Buddha. And so those people who've been very diligent in their dana and their sila and their cultivation, enjoying the fruits of that in the heaven realm, waiting for Lord Buddha to become enlightened, waiting to give ear and listen to the Dhamma. So many, many, many devas became. Anya Kondanya had made the vow to be the first human to realize Dhamma listening to the Buddha's first sermon. Many, many, many devas had been waiting for the same occasion and were liberated on the same occasion. And it's very interesting because these places tend to be pretty busy. And the local Indian people don't, they're not, to them I think Lord Buddha is, a kind of a minor deity and one of the many avatars of Vishnu. It's not, that's how they see him. They don't see him as the teacher of gods and humans who realize something higher than heaven. So they don't give the same quality of reverence that the Buddhists do. There's a lot of just kind of uh, like going on a picnic vibe and uh, kind of he haring and he hawing and uh, selfies and a lot of noise. But uh, what's interesting is, and we have to remind ourselves that we are guests in their country and they can behave how they like. And uh, But what's interesting is when we meditate in these places, despite the fact of the busyness and noise, the lack of reverence sometimes, the mind often becomes very peaceful. It's uh, in a place where thousands, possibly millions of devas became enlightened and uh, many humans became enlightened. And then, of course, it was probably a monastery for at least a thousand years, 1500 years, <clears throat> many more humans, monks and nuns became enlightened and lay people became stream enterers and tens of thousands of people will have been developing their jhanas. And when that much potent spiritual realization and cultivation happens in a place, something definitely sticks to the earth element in these areas. So many people had a peaceful meditation despite the noise of the crowds and the dirty air after this we went i've had the experience i've led many pilgrimages and attended many pilgrimages and this time i wanted to do things slightly differently because if you are traveling in northern india in winter where the air is misty in the morning and dirty because the dirt hangs in the fog if we were to go from Sarnath on the traditional pilgrimage and then go to Vaisali, Kusinara, Lumbini and Savati, by the time you get to Lumbini, everybody has a chest infection or a throat infection or a sinus infection because a couple of people get sick with sharing the same bus. Everybody's sharing the air on the bus. Everybody's sick. And then you're in cool, cold, damp air. So it doesn't, it also, it doesn't get better. 
and then you have the experience of because the body can't quite get on top of it and then you have the experience of people coming back and being sick for weeks once they get home so i thought since i've done that five times already i'm gonna try something different and so we i came up with a paradigm of doing a half the traditional pilgrimage and then adding a different different adjunct different focus so when we flew to Aurangabad in a drier, warmer region of India, uh, only a few people caught colds and they recovered quite quickly. So we, um, the whole bus didn't get sick. So Ajanta Cave Monastery Complex was a place where monks lived from, I think, the 2nd century BC until the 7th or 8th century common era so 900 years and uh, one of the reasons I wanted to take my students there was as I was talking about earlier just to see how other generations express their faith and feel the faith of a thousand years of Buddhist practice the kind of faith that can turn a mountain into a monastery and turn a cliff face into a vihara a meditation hall dwellings for monks you really can feel it. Um, so that was the, you see the details of the carvings on the frescoes on the faces of the cave are just uh, very, very beautiful. This is cave number 26, which is uh, probably the finest and most grand. The last one as you, as you go along, you see the vaulted ceiling and the detail on every pillar and every side wall. And there's a chedi in the middle of the, uh, the particular effect of this roof design is that when, if one person chants in there, everybody can hear it. And uh, so when we did our puja, everyone can hear my voice. I can hear everyone else's voice. There's just this incredible sense of resonance and there's this really amazing sense of oneness. And uh, I have other feelings about Ajanta. I feel that I, I feel that I lived, possibly lived there as a monk for several lives, I think. One of those lives I think I would have been interested in the paintings, another life I was interested in uh, sculpture, and I think I did some meditation practice and some chanting there as well. I always have a feeling of coming home when I go there. And the rap it's interesting to experience different types of rapture. The rapture that I feel when I'm in a janta is very heart, on the very heart level. It's a feeling of love, and uh, so I think I really loved the lives there, and I really loved the place. And so the kind of rapture I experience there often ends up with tears streaming down my face. And uh, I don't experience that kind of rapture so often. And um, it's a little bit embarrassing sometimes. You're trying to lead the chanting and you have to kind of spit up some mucus and blow your nose and, and keep trying to chant. <laughs> but uh, we had a beautiful puja in here on the second day. I told the group, you know, if we rush to the last cave, we'll probably get about an hour to ourselves before the tourists arrive. And... Um, that was a successful strategy. We did get about an hour and a half in there and uh, Yom Ern chanted a beautiful Thai chant in praise to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and Shivani chanted the Nibbana Sutta in there and we all did our puja together. I think we did the Ratana Sutta and the Metta Sutta, praise to the three jewels and uh, very, very beautiful puja and I felt very, very happy, very, very joyful, very, very rapturous and very, very teary. And uh, I think what's interesting is it wasn't just me. I was looking at the, the monk next to me. I was like, yeah, he's got tears rolling down his face too. <laughs> it's like, I think many of us felt that in this place. Kuba Jo, Tan Jo, Tan Ajahn disciple, and uh, my younger brother in the holy life, he has some skill in sculpting, and he has sculpted several statues uh, at the request of Ajahn Anand. He and I are working on a very big project now, making a replica of the Buddha Metta statue contained in the Mahabodhi temple. So he was also like, uh, it's like finding himself in heaven, finding in this place with all of these sculptures just everywhere. It's like outside walls, inside walls, posts, jetties, ceilings, and uh, every nook and cranny. And uh, studying the, the the proportions and the the, the way that, Indian artists represented the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, very beautiful. Everyone was happy. This is our quiet morning.
There's a very particular feeling when you come into a space where it's it's a process of extraction. Nothing has been added. They haven't like put these posts together or built this stupra. It's been carved from the top down to the bottom. Probably taking, you know, for sure, taking decades. They did not have diamond tipped drill bits. They just had chisels and hammers. There's something about the kind of grounded, solid, uh, and being embraced by that. And also the the faith that has kind of infused into that solidity. It's a very interesting combination of feelings, groundedness, firmness, solidity, with love, gratitude, faith, joy, devotion. Very nice place to soak up the atmosphere. See these beautiful Buddhas that are painted on the pillars. So these paintings are like a thousand years old and they're, they're still there. Beautiful mandalas on the ceilings. I quite like the aesthetic of the caves now with uh, most of the colour fallen off and the natural stone revealed and mostly just bits of the undercoat of white in the, in the cracks. But in its day, it seems like everything was covered in colour from the, from the bottom of the paint to the, to, the, to the bottom of the post to the top of the ceiling. <coughs> Indians have a, a special appetite for vibrant colors <laughs> to this day. This is a famous painting of Padmapani, Bodhisattva, and there's a Vajrapani on the other wall from one of the Mahayana temples. Cave number one, I believe. Lotus motif on the ceiling. Yes, Buddha's in the ceiling. This is another cave which is nearby. Apparently the trade routes changed and people just weren't coming by the Ajanta cave complex anymore and some kind of prince wasn't a very effective king and uh, the kingdom degenerated and maybe it was invaded or something. People moved to different areas. Another place was developed by subsequent kings, Elora cave complex, which has a... But that king... Those kings weren't Buddhists but they believed in supporting the three main religions of the day. So that was the, the Hindu tradition, the Jain tradition, and the Buddhist tradition. So there's the Buddhist caves, the Hindu caves, and the Jain caves in the same place. Elora, it seems like the sculptors were getting better at architecture and the, the scale of the, the size of the cave. And then you've got these like three and four story buildings carved into a cliff face with nice big verandas and grand staircases. <clears throat> this was the Kailash shrine to Lord Shiva, which is a very, very popular site for um, modern pilgrims. Incredible. That was a whole temple that was carved out of a... You can see this, the walls at the side. That's where the top of the mountain was. And then they carved a whole temple out of the mountain and there's yeah the staircases you go inside and there's a shiva lingam and there's a different forms of shiva ganesha and this was also completely painted outside and inside in its day let's see what faith and devotion but this is a, one of the reasons we went at that part of the year before chinese new year and not after chinese new year many of my malaysian and singaporean students needed to be home at chinese new year this is a hotter part of India, and um, after Chinese New Year, it'd be really hot. Inside the caves, it's nice, but walking around on the, it's, uh, even for Southeast Asians, it's hot. That time of the year, the weather was perfect. So this is a very big Buddha statue. Is it cave number? I'm trying to remember, remember the name, number of the cave. Is it number nine? upstairs on the third floor. I have a very special feeling about this Buddha. I think this Buddha was very blessed by some great practitioners. And uh, we did our, we did one of our pujas on the second time we went there, we did our puja here in the afternoon. Lovely afternoon light.
It's very nice to walk on these verandas and these paths where literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other Buddhist practitioners have walked and meditate in places where hundreds of thousands of other people have meditated for centuries and centuries. It's a... Uh, talking about cultivating faith and connecting with with the faith of others i think it does expand one's faith when you just when you just encompass and recollect the faith of others how how you know a hundred generations of buddhists have demonstrated their faith and their practice and, and rejoice in that and feel it has a very uh, heart expanding consciousness expanding and it stretches our faith yeah. You can see people seem quite joyful. Hi, Prajan. This is the last picture we last have. Last one, okay. So after this, the group flew, most of them, to their various home places. And uh, then the then the important, very important, but quite challenging aspect of pilgrimage practice comes into being. It's like you set your resolution, resolutions, you set your determinations, but then it's very, very important when you get home, you, ha you actually have to do it. You know, Those first few days after, after the pilgrimage back home, yeah, there's going to be a bit of tiredness. You might need to rest a bit, but then we do need to remember, I'm just doing it now myself back in Anandagiri. I've... Um, I've not completely unpacked my suitcase. I've left it in the middle of my bedroom as a reminder that you've just come back from pilgrimage. I'm supposed to see that and I'm supposed to remember. You Remember your pilgrimage? Remember the different aspiration? Because we can fall back into our habits. So I'm literally putting my suitcase in a place where I'll trip over it to remember, don't forget it. You can slowly unpack this and, you know, you open the suitcase, you can smell India. It's like different smells to thailand and it's like okay remember that and then and then i've 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 got like an idea of my next four or five paintings that i want to do in my water painting hobby but i haven't let myself pick up a brush yet i'm like no you get up in the morning you meditate before arms round you meditate after arms round you try to keep your one and a half or two hours sit in the afternoon once you've reintegrated and re-established your disciplines very firmly then you pick up your paintbrush Achalo Biku. And uh, so I'm doing that. I'm in the process of doing that. And uh, we can't just make the aspiration and the determination that we do need to be determined to keep them to the best of our ability. So I'm, I hope it's going okay for you, for me saying this is a bit of a reminder to you. What did you determine? How is your determination going? How is your uh, faith manifesting as effort and consistency? And um, of course, after the, after the pilgrimage part, I spent about a week in Mumbai. This was very deliberate because I, this was my 19th trip to India. And the overwhelming need to understand that Bangkok and Bogaya is, Bogaya is a three hour flight from Bangkok. It's like uh, regional for where, where I live, especially with the advent of uh, low cost airlines. That was a fortunate synchronicity with this lifetime that I was able to live in Thailand and low cost airlines came into being and uh, the knee pain aside <laughs> it's worth it I'm very tall squeezing into low cost airlines is a special practice I had uh, four weeks a month to practice in Bodh Gaya and I was embracing the next thousand hours of my and most people know I've practiced 4,000 hours on, of meditation under the Bodhi tree and I recently made the aspiration that I would try to do that to take it to the 5,000 hour state level and realize that um, I really appreciate and benefit from doing these meditation retreats in Bodh Gaya. When you're, when you're an abbot, when you're in your monastery, there are abbot duties, there are teacher duties. And when I am able to go to Bodh Gaya and focus fully on my own practice, it's very helpful for me. And, uh, I was trying to investigate why, why, you know, having been there 19 trips to India, I think about 15 intensive meditation retreats under the Bodhi tree for myself now. 
and I'm, I'm trying to bring more of a noticing, okay, how does it work? Why does it work? Why, why do you get good results there? What's going on? And because there is a lot of coarse energies under the Bodhi tree on a, on a basic level, there's a lot of different types of people there for different reasons. Not every group is well behaved. But because it's the seed of enlightenment in this universe, uh, I know one monk who has a divine eye who says that from the airport, he can see the radiance of the Bhadra Asana spreading to heaven. He can see that from the airport. And then the same wonderful monk said that at any one time, there are always 10,000 devas circumambulating Bodh Gaya from this and other universes. But just like humans, devas want merit. Merit is synonymous with happiness. So I think what happens for myself, a mind which is attenuated by three decades of meditation, when my mind begins to get a little bit peaceful, what I think occurs is the vibration of purity, because it's a place where four Buddhas of this eon have been enlightened, combined with the rapture that the 10,000 devas are feeling, because they're literally just above your head. The Mahabodhi temple is 54 meters tall. So you've got 10,000 devas above your head. And so because when my mind gets a little bit more concentrated and a little bit more sensitive, it's kind of sensitive to the rapture of 10,000 devas, then that that's going to manifest as a special quality of rapture for oneself as well. If you can just sit long enough for your mind to get sensitive enough, we are kind of amorphic, we are sensitive creatures, you can resonate. So you just sit there long enough with your intention to make your mind peaceful and then those blessings of all of those devas increasing, devas with right view, good devas increasing their merits, that rapture. So when we were talking about the factors of jhana earlier, when the rapture gets stronger and you keep sitting longer and longer, then the tranquility is deeper, more vast, and then there's a possible there's periods of one-pointedness. And so getting uh, just familiar with that, how does it work? Why does it work? And... Um, in some respects, I think it's getting an even more difficult place to practice because the numbers of what I would call Hindu Buddhists is in, tourists is increasing. When I first started going, well, 21 years ago, uh, there wasn't much of a middle class in, in, in India, not in Bihar, but uh, India is really developing now. It's becoming a much more developed nation with a much larger middle class. And so that means that people have cars and people have spare time and people have some cash and they want to make merit. They want to go places. They want to see things. And and there's a lot of people coming to Bogaya to get married these days. I think these days Indian tourists probably are equal to overseas tourists now. So for their economy, they're very welcoming to Indian tourists. And uh, just sheer numbers, sheer numbers of the people are coming to the place. And as I said earlier, the, the locals don't quite give it the same reverence as uh, actual Buddhists and I can understand why and then uh, so it's noisier and then the, the local Indians who are trying to get donations from the Indian tourists that they've increased in number as well and uh, they're not very well behaved they're right under there under the Bodhi tree fortunately for myself because I've been there 15 times I I have a lot of experience of practicing with this phenomenon and I, and I can practice with it one of the benefits of having irritating phenomenon impinging is that you have to cultivate metta it's like what am i going to do am i going to sit here and be annoyed and judgmental or am i going to cultivate metta to the point where i don't even care i just wish them well no matter how obnoxious no matter how deceitful no matter how rude no matter how inappropriate may they be well may they be happy and when you get your metta pumping to that degree where you really have metta for very annoying ill-behaved people it's a lot of metta. <laughs> and then once you have that metta really, really pumping, you increase more numbers of beings and then all beings. And so probably in the eight hours of, I was saying about eight and a half hours this time around, there's probably about four hours a day of metta, you know. And so then that metta, when it's really established, the mind can be glad, the mind can be peaceful, and the mind's happy to settle on the breath and uh, with the extra help, I think, of the devas and the rapture, you can find, I call it Teflon mind, you can find a space where nothing sticks. All of the noise, all of the impingement, there's just, a, there's just awareness of sound, but nobody listening. 
There's just noise, no liking or disliking, just awareness, spacious, broad, aware of sounds arising and ceasing, not liking, not disliking. And um, there's always such a tremendous relief when a sense of self that judges things falls away. And, and it's a very, very instructive about where the, what real peace is and what the components of true peace are and what the self view is and how it functions and the, the way it grasps and the way it manifests and what's it like when it falls away for a period of time. And then, and then it's really, really interesting to a, to a professional long-term meditator like myself. It's really, really interesting to see, well, how come yesterday with the same phenomenon, you weren't annoyed at all? And how come today you're annoyed? It's a, it's a wonderful, what is it that's annoyed? Where is that annoyance? Can you find that sense of vast space and emptiness again? Okay, do it again. And you often can. If you're giving yourself eight and a half hours a day and you're doing it for a month, you, when you're going to, okay, you're here for three hours. You can either be annoyed with this or you can find a way to not be annoyed with it. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a teacher. So I, I benefit tremendously from the fact that it forces me to use every skillful means that I have and every skerrick of patient endurance and determination that I have and whatever faith I have, I have to use it all. And in doing that, you do get some very nice, bright, peaceful mind states. And um, so I just feel grateful, feel very, very grateful to have had the opportunity. And uh, I, if the world permits, I have to go back four more times to finish my vow. And uh, you're welcome to join me, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> for a period of time and uh, many many people do have the experience it's very instructive and, uh, even people on their first first trip to Bogaya like you know when we were there in the middle of the Nyingma Monlam Chenmo there may have been 10,000 people in that small space and people still had peaceful meditations you know oftentimes the first it's just too disorienting it's too weird strange noises Tibetan cymbals drums horns and uh, but once your mind kind of, I think the way no way most of our minds work is when there's that much noise and impingement, you're on guard because anything could happen. You're in the middle of a mob, you know. But when you survive it the first time and nothing happened, the mind is learning how to relax in the middle of a noisy, thronging crowd. And then people, people have very peaceful meditations. And it usually manifests in the, in the manner of feeling tremendous gratitude and love for the Buddha, deepening one's faith, and then we channel that into increasing our efforts in practice. So I hope that something I said in my meandering, multifaceted ramble may have been helpful to you. And uh, I offer this for your reflection. Thank you, Ajahn. Good night. May you have a good week ahead. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.